Um, so this video is really for people who are interested in, in raising homelessness as a political issue on a local level. Um, one of the big regrets I've got probably, certainly in kind of my, my kind of input into just that so far, is that I haven't really kind of grasped how influential local politicians are in how council homes and services are delivered. Um, and so whilst there's some really good kind of national campaigns going on, you know, uh, shelter and crisis, pushing for some really kind of big picture things, um, I think we're, we're, as a sector, we're really missing a big trick um, around kind of local politics. Um, because most councillors, they care about their local community. If they were informed about the issues around kind of gatekeeping and stuff like that, I think they would kind of probably be a bit more, um, you know, kind of be a bit more kind of forceful, a bit more assertive about how they interact with councils. Um, so really, as I say, this 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 video here, I'm, I'm kind of commenting on a, on a housing committee that happened on the 16th of June, which is about a week ago, um, 2021. Um, and basically, between the four of us caseworkers at Just Us, we asked a question each um, to the council in advance. Um, the reason we give it to them in advance is that it gives them time to then prepare an answer. Otherwise, the answer will just be, we don't know, we'll get back to you kind of thing. So we've, we've kind of given the, the council advance warning of, of the questions we're going to ask. Um, every council will have a committee that covers homelessness. It might not be called the housing committee, but every council will have open meetings which any member of the public can attend and any me member of the public can ask a question at that meeting we're not quite sure on the rules because we don't know if, if people are limited to one question each we're not really sure there's not a lot of detail on on the bedford borough council's website about that kind of stuff so at the moment we're just kind of staying on the safe side we're asking a question each um, and really the questions are about getting councillors to understand the issue you know if, if, you know, if, if councillors kind of took to kind of the, the myths that are out there that are often per, um, perpetuated by homelessness services, they would assume that, you know, homeless, homelessness is a result of, you know, in, incompetent people who can't manage their own tenancy and, you know, they need all this support to kind of, you know, these support workers to tie their shoelaces and stuff. And actually that's just simply isn't backed up by any evidence, really. There are obviously some people with some significant support needs. You know why aren't they getting support under the care act if they if their support needs are so great because they should be um but actually what we're seeing and it's kind of you know what we're seeing kind of really much is in line with the housing first kind of stuff you know if you give people a home first it's suitable it's decent it's affordable even if they need some support kind of going in there you know to manage it they will maintain their home whereas if you put people through hostels and so on they will get evicted because hostels are not nice places to live and the rules are really stupid sometimes and arbitrary. So that's what, you know, that's kind of what this is really about. It's about counsellors, you know, kind of asking questions of counsellors so they can kind of maybe think through some stuff and, and start hopefully being a bit more inquisitive themselves. Because one criticism I've got of counsellors in general and general politicians is that I don't think they're inquisitive enough. I think often they'll get involved in, a, in an individual's case They'll ask a question of the council, the council will give them the answer and they'll kind of take that as if that's, you know, that's gospel. And actually we've seen a number of kind of subject access requests from clients where councillors have been involved and yet mistakes have still been made, you know, like perverse decisions have still been made, people have still been left homeless, even though the councillors were watching. And I think because councillors didn't understand the law, which is fair enough because they've got no reason to, and didn't kind of, you know, just, just as I say, kind of accepted what the housing officer said, when actually I don't think that's necessarily a safe assumption to make. Um, so, and as an aside, I think politicians in general are very naive when they talk to homeless and services, because I don't know if they realise when you talk to an organisation, they're not telling you everything that, they, you know, they're not telling you the whole story. They're telling you a very much an airbrushed kind of side of things. Um, you know, it, to put themselves in a positive light. I mean, I remember working at an agency once where we had a politician coming around and we were literally briefed on what we could and couldn't say. You know, every place was immaculate. You know, we kind of made sure it all looked really nice because we we're on our best behaviour. And actually, that means that councillors don't really know the, the truth of what's going on. And I think councillors tend to believe professionals over the word of people using services. And I think that's a real mistake. I think, in my experience, people using services tend to be you know they're obviously kind of caught up with the emotions of it and that's not that's not criticism um you know, but you know so they're not necessarily expressing it in a kind of you know a cold kind of cold and kind of clear way because of the situation they're in but 
generally speaking, I, I take the word of, of people using services over the service themselves because in my experience, professionals are far more likely to uh, twist the truth in order to protect their reputation and so on than the clients are. So that's kind of just an aside. Um, and sorry, going, yeah, going way off here. So going back to the committee, we asked four questions. Um, so I asked my question and then my colleagues submitted their questions via email so they didn't have to attend because, you know, the councillors are very nice, you know, don't get me wrong. So when you when you come into this virtual meeting room or whatever, they're very friendly and stuff. And so it's not it's not a criticism of them, but it is still very nerve wracking. You know, you're, you're asking important questions. And my question in particular was very unfriendly in some sense. You know, I think it was a fair question, but it was not a question. You know, it was a question that was going to provoke you know, potential defensiveness and so on. And I think actually it was dealt with well on the night by the councillors and, and kind of the, the council officers. So I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to play the question. I'm going to sort of stop and start it just to kind of add in some stuff because although on the night it seemed quite underwhelming, um, what's interesting is kind of a lot of is what's happening between the lines. And I'm also going to give a little bit of rationale as to why we asked these questions and, and how we worded them because I think, we, you know, I'm, I'm happy with how it went. Question two, I think maybe didn't quite land very well because I think we were maybe it was a bit too ambitious for this for the setting. But you know, I'll, I'll kind of talk about that in a bit. But as I say, my question was first. Um, it's a question which essentially accuses the council of historically being pretty perverse. You know, talking about outrageous kind of cases about gatekeeping and so on. These are things which, when we raised them initially, sort of you know six seven years ago. We were told unequivocally by the council that they do not gatekeep and they do not break the law. Now, that's nonsense because they were and they did and they got caught doing it and they paid compensation for it. But, you know, it's just the kind of reality of actually this is a very politicised issue and you're not necessarily going to get honest answers. And, and in some sense, you're going to get kind of politicised responses, which I think is a shame. I think it's a shame that we live in a country where politicians can't be honest because they're going to get there for fear of getting taken out of context. So I'm hoping that. I'm at least being fair with what I'm my, with my commentary here. Um, you know, if, if, I, if you don't think I am, put it in the comment section or something. And sorry, YouTube stuff. Do subscribe to our channel. Do like the video. Do, you know, any videos you see that you think would be useful to other people, do feel free to share them on your other social media pages because we, are, we do know now, know, we do now know of cases where a worker has come across a video. The information in the video has basically directly led to someone getting housed as a result of it. So, you know, you can do a lot of work in the sector and stuff and work very hard. Sometimes, you know, it's just kind of, there are, there are easy wins. And I think information is kind of the key to that. So if you see something which you think, oh, hang on a minute, I know someone would be interested in that, please do share it. Please do get the message around. This information is, as I say, gets people housed. And I think ultimately it's going to hopefully influence the way the sector deals with homelessness and how our country deals with homelessness. So, um, yeah. I'm going to get started now, so that's enough of me waffling. So I'm going to play the question, as I say, I'll kind of just chip in when I've got something to say about it, um, and then we'll go from there. Just as I've supported many people to get housed by challenging incorrect decisions and gatekeeping by the council since we formed in 2014, um, and we've supported a significant number of people to get compensation when the law has not been followed, in some cases, these could reasonably be described as outrageous and, why, and uh, raise wider serious questions about the homelessness sector in Bedford. So when I'm saying this, there are a handful of cases I particularly got in mind when I'm saying this, and I, and I do think outrageous is the right word. I mean, it wasn't literally because part of the compensation claim was based on that word outrage from the LGO guidance on remedies. So it was something that anyone would, would clearly see was just was just terrible. And the, the kind of comment I made there about, you know, the implications it has for the wider homelessness sector, in certainly in one case that, you know, probably is the most outrageous I've seen, most of the homelessness organisations in the town were implicated because they all knew about these situations and they didn't challenge the council. They effectively just let it happen for months. And that led to a kind of a lot of harm happening that was completely uh, avoidable. So that's a, the case I'm alluding to there isn't actually quite finished yet. So when, when we've kind of got compensation all sorted, I'm probably going to talk a lot about that case. But that's kind of the background that I'm talking about. Um, and as I say, this is not a friendly question. I've just basically, as I say, I've used that word gatekeeping. Um, and it's interesting, I'll say it now in case I forget later, it's interesting that the council's response does, does not deny that that was an issue. Um, so that is, you know, that's a significant move on from, as I say, six, seven years ago, when they were re resolute that, that gatekeeping did not happen in their council. So 
um, yeah, that's that's something that I'm kind of, I guess, is, is a... Given how small our capacity has been, we believe it is likely there have been more cases over the years where people have been wrongly left homeless but were never confirmed. We recognise that significant efforts have been made by the Council's Housing Department to meaningfully improve the service and culture in the last few years, and our current perspective is the lack of resources is now the biggest issue facing the team. So again, I'm not blowing smoke here. I generally believe that. Um, you know, there are an, a, a key number of, of senior officers in the council and, and frontline workers as well, who, you know, who I believe are decent. We don't always we don't always agree with everything. That's kind of that's yeah. We're always going to push for more, no matter what, basically. But there are people that I, I do trust. You know, that's not something I could say six, seven years ago. In fact, I would say I decidedly, you know, didn't trust those. So some of those officers back then. But um, you know, I do think that they are definitely trying. And as I said in the question there. For me, the biggest issue now with resort is with resources. It's not with the kind of the culture or the kind of you know, the, the gatekeeping issues and the perverse decision making. The biggest issue now is the fact that they have got savage council cuts across the board. And that means that it's very difficult for them to do their jobs well. You know, it's just it's just it's almost I would say it's impossible, basically. Um, I wrote, asked a question about that in a previous one, which I'll do me uh, do a video about in due course. So that's where we're coming from. You know, as I say, and, and I don't think that's a national trend. When we work with other councils, I can think of a few in particular. I won't bother naming at this point. They're they're still outrageous. You know, they're still you know still you can't you, you can't even sniff justice with some of those councils. They don't even respond to legal kind of you know legal requirements you know on in a timely manner or anything, let alone actually make the right decisions. So, Bedford Borough Council has done something very right. I would say it's probably politically driven. Something I didn't mention actually already is that in Bedford we've got. I think it's a majority of Lib Dem councillors. There's 40 councillors in total. If the Lib Dems don't have a majority, they're certainly the largest group in, um, in the council. And we've worked with a number of Lib Dem councillors really positively. So sometimes they'll refer people to us. We've referred people to them when we're kind of really stuck. Um, and we've seen some really, you know, the impression I get is that they genuinely care and, and, yeah, and they genuinely want, genuinely, genuinely want things, things to change. We've got directly elected mayor, who again, I think, is very intelligent and I think really does care about homelessness. The problem he's got is he's got about 100 other things to care about as well, which are, you know, uh, very important as well. Um, so our job is to, I guess part of this is about trying to push homelessness up the up the list of priorities a little bit. Um, and also we've had some kind of good interactions with the MP's office, uh, which happens to be Labour and also a couple of Green councillors as well. So, so basically, and, and that's, you know, that's some of its luck, some of its kind of, you know, just our, our kind of, concerted effort to kind of get to know councillors and, and kind of work with them because you can kind of get some really quick wins and it's really positive for everyone so again you know as much as I can give advice given that we don't really know what we're doing do you get to know your local councillors do you get to know the ones who care um, and particularly ones who do potentially have expertise in in related areas so you might well have lawyers and so on who kind of they get this stuff without having to explain too much to them what, what the deal is but yeah that's a long way of saying I believe Bedford councillors dramatically improves as I say not just in the service but also the culture of staff um, and I'm going to have to say that you know I think just us has played quite a significant role in that you know uh, you know what's the difference between us and the other councils we work with well you know Bedford Borough Council has got an organisation which will complain when they think it needs to be you know something needs to be complained about um, we're not funded by the council we're, we're independent so we can do that and I think a lot of areas sadly lack that kind of that critical friend and it, you know, I do use that kind of term literally you know in one sense we're glass half empty people but um we you know, we do raise kind of genuine issues and that does give the council you know a chance to actually improve so i think that's pretty much the end of this question i oh, know there's a little the actual questions coming up so that's just about it. we are though still seeing never events and believe that there would be value in reviewing certain previous cases in a structured way to learn lessons for the future does the committee agree that it would be helpful for the committee to receive regular reports regarding complaints received about housing and homeless matters uh, with the aim of identifying themes and opportunities to improve services there's the question um i talked there about never events and i think it's important that we do kind of use terminology to shape how people think about stuff because in one sense i've seen a lot of councils just shrug at the things like gatekeeping they're like Meh, you know no one follows the law end of we need to be talking about these kind of things as never events they're things which you are within the nhs you'd be you know, you'd be hauled in front of the coroner's court potentially for these kind of mistakes um, so it's, it's, I'm using those kind of words carefully. Um, and, you know, here's, this is the question to the committee is, you know, can they put some kind of formal mechanism in place to review 
um, complaints because I literally don't know how much the councillors know about the kind of complaints we're seeing. So when I talk about outrageous complaints, I've got no idea whether they know what we're talking about, whether they're ever kind of exposed to how ridiculous and how disgusting some of these things are. And the question is really designed to kind of get councillors some, you know, to give them some kind of ability to, to hold the council to account for complaints. Um, and, and in terms of kind of recent never events, I've kind of said that things are much better than they used to be, and they are. Most recent upheld complaints we had which resulted in compensation was a 17 year old back at the end of 2020. Um, and they were bounced between children's services and housing. Um, and that should never happen. Basically, they were left homeless. So, you know, a pretty straightforward co compensation claim. Interestingly, with that, there wasn't really any arguing about it. They just put their hands up and, and paid compensation. Whereas before, we take like, you know, a hundred, you know, maybe 100 hours of arguing sometimes it felt like. And then the most recent upheld complaint was about someone who had um, very severe cancer, let's put it like that, and was undergoing chemotherapy. And as a result of the treatment, was simply not able to get up and down the stairs into her flat. So she approached the council's housing register, gave the council reasons to believe she might be homeless, therefore should have triggered Section 184 under the Housing Act, but didn't. Um, and so she got left in that situation for longer than she should have. Um, so again, once we got involved, you know, again, it's, it's kind of a, a, an indicator of how good the council are now. They just they were just really good from from realizing the error. They they really kind of did pull things together and get the person suitably housed very quickly. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, and thank you for the positive feedback that you've given about the improvements that you've seen in the housing service over the last few years. And yes, I, I, I note your concerns about the risk of mistakes being made when assessing homeless applications. And that being the case, I agree that it would be helpful for the committee to receive a report regarding the complaints received about the service and how these can be used as a learning experience to improve the service for people that people receive. So one thing I didn't mention about this question is that I, I, it's not just a one off question. In my mind, this question is going to lead to further questions in, in subsequent committees. And what I really think is going to be necessary to improve services locally is that there is some kind of formal learning event. Um, a little bit like a, an adult safeguarding review or something, a case review, looking at some of these more outrageous complaints and basically getting the key homes partners in the town together and like I say, and kind of go through those complaints and kind of work out, okay, what needs to change in order for that never to happen again. Because as I say, it wasn't just the council failing, it was services across the board. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to name them, but it was the significant, you know, it was the kind of the most obvious partners in the town that deal with people off sleeping and, and, and single homeless people. So yeah, that's, that's something which I'm going to hopefully working up to. So there's, there's a little bit, there's an element of this just being groundwork for that as well. But the report that's submitted to the, co the committee will most likely be discoverable under the FOI kind of legislation. So we'll be able to see a copy of that and we'll just be able to kind of see how much detail councillors do understand about this stuff. So that's, yeah, in one sense, question one, this is a good outcome. You know, they, they basically agreed to what we've asked for. Um, and, you know, the, yeah, the, there's, it certainly paves the way for some more work and more scrutiny, which I think is kind of probably the key word here. It's about housing officers, housing, housing option services being scrutinised effectively in order for them to improve. And so a report will be added to the committee's work programme, which we'll be discussing under item number 10. But whilst on about this, um, it's also a good opportunity to mention how the council has stepped up throughout the pandemic to support every, anyone in the borough that is homeless. A lot of good work has been done. And unlike many councils, we have ensured that no one needs to sleep rough because they are homeless and we are still providing accommodation even where the council does not have a statutory duty to house them. So um, what Councillor Atkins is saying here is absolutely true. I find it a little bit frustrating because in one sense, what Councillor Atkins is talking about now is the stuff around the COVID provision, which Bedford Borough Council definitely went over and above what they had to. And again, I think that's an indicator of political will and the culture of housing staff. We've seen some really good outcomes with that. Um, but ultimately, this is not, you know, so what I'm, what, what the, the issue I'm bringing to the, cap, the, cap, the committee here is the, the kind of the duties that the council has to homeless people under the Housing Act and where that's basically not being discharged lawfully. The stuff that came with COVID is not really about those legal duties. And I would probably raise a couple of points here. As I say, it's not 
the council act is saying is wrong the, it's worded carefully because there are still a small number of people who do continue to sleep rough despite there being an offer of accommodation for them and i would say my opinion being that unless as professional services across the board recognize that that group of people are often they often arrive in that position of, of not wanting to engage because they've had terrible experiences of engaging before so they've been let down by councils they've been treated shamefully by councils they've been let down by voluntary sector organizations and so they kind of yeah and they're often kind of told you know that there's it's i'm not seeing it in bedford but i've seen it elsewhere where they kind of try and you know people are trying to coerced into options which just aren't suitable for them and they're kind of told you know this is your only option take it or leave it whereas actually the legal stuff that i'm talking about for me it's the solution to homelessness could because it's not it shouldn't be an issue of charity it's an issue of civil rights sit you know citizens of of britain and people with settled status and so on have various rights under ha under housing law and those rights if they were followed um would give people genuine choice about where they live and that is a key thing, you know, it's, it's no good just saying, you know, here's a hostel over here, take it or leave it. If people were treated law lawfully, they would get potential choice on the housing register, even though it might be quite a restricted choice. But bottom line is you're treating them as citizens, not as charity cases. And I think that is kind of a key part of the solution to homelessness. And as I say, unless we unless we can acknowledge as a sector that we have done very, you know, we have we have failed people for decades inadvertently, you know, in, with the best of intentions. But unless we kind of unless we recognize this, I don't think we're really going to ever reach that kind of that small number of people who just refuse to engage. You know, and, and it's kind of it's kind of um, ticked off as like, oh, you know, they refused an offer or they chose to sleep rough. It's more complicated than that. And I think actually that's a little bit of victim blaming it can kind of lead into. So, yeah, as I say, that's kind of, you know, that's that, that, that's the kind of stuff um, Councillor Atkins is talking about at this point. So, thank you for your question. And we'll, sure. say, we'll, we'll discuss it again under item number 10. So okay. if, we, if we move on to the second question, which is from John Allen, and John can't be here this evening. So what we've arranged is, is that Lee, who has the question, that Lee, if you want to put forward the question. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the, the question from John is, we recently supported an individual to get housed that the we being just us in this case. It came to light that the council decided in December 2019 that she was not vulnerable and was therefore denied statutory housing assistance, even though she was involved with the pain clinic and rheumatology department. The formal decision from the council stated that, and this is it, end quote, you told me that you had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis in your feet, hips and shoulders and PTSD. You advised me you were prescribed gabapentin, 120 milligrams, morphine sulfate, 60 milligrams, and paracetamol. Having taken account of all these conditions, I have reached the conclusion that I do not consider that you are under any disability. And the question then goes on. As I hope you can see, this decision does not appear to take genuine account of all these health conditions or go into any detail of the impact of these conditions. Although this may seem insignificant, the reality is that people are housed or left homeless on the basis of these types of considerations. Will the Housing Committee commit to increasing the training budget for all housing staff in the Council to ensure that officers have the knowledge needed to discharge the Council's duties, including under the Equality Act 2010, the Care Act 2014 and the Data Protection Act 2018? So there's the question. I mean, this, this, as I say, I'm not quite sure this question completely lands in the setting. Um, in one sense, it's an attempt from us to articulate the kinds of decisions that we see being made. And in one sense, these decisions are often 10 pages long, so it's quite difficult to encapsulate, you know, the the, the kind of the the flaws in them in, in a way which is kind of easily kind of um, accessible in a, in a setting like this. So the individual, as I say, you know, we actually, so obviously this is anonymous, but we've actually removed some of the, the kind of health issues that they had from the, the account there. So it's actually, they're actually even more kind of disabled than they, that they are on paper there um and 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 yeah this is just an example where the officer most likely doesn't has never had training about the equality act therefore doesn't understand how you would assess someone to have a disability um which would involve kind of working out what would happen to this person if they stop taking their meds which of course would probably lead to this person seizing up potentially you know they've got serious arthritis they're under the pain clinic it's it's kind of serious stuff plus they've got ptsd you know, if they if they stop taking that treatment, what would happen to them? Well, it's going to have substantial impacts on their day-to-day -day living activities. 
so that you know this is that's that's kind of the that's the that's the background of it I don't, as i said i don't know how well that comes across in the question um but ultimately the decision essentially pays lip service to it so it kind of yeah records all the health issues and then says you know i've taken into these account i say that you haven't got a disability there's no real consideration that it's just literally a template letter and that in turn had an impact on the ultimate decision was that they were not in priority need when actually this is a case i use in our training which is like a really easy obvious one that they are in priority need because of the way um, arthritis would work if someone was homeless so that's the kind of the, the background um back in the autumn of 2019 we did an foi request and basically asked for an account of what training housing officers get and at the time, the answer was there is no record of the training that council officers get. And it's one of the improvements that that FOI resulted in. So now they are doing it and they have kind of embarked on sort of a training kind of uh, program for housing officers, which is all good. Another, that's an example of where an FOI, you know, carefully worded FOI can in, improve service kind of delivery without really much work. From our point of view, I appreciate the people who had to kind of do the training stuff would have, but that's something that should have been happening anyway. Um, as you'll see in the answer now, this is not something we're aware of. We don't understand the kind of the workings of a council, but um, essentially this is a question that the, the council's budget is obviously not something which is under the remit of the housing committee. Um, so I'll just let Councillor Atkins' answer play and then I'll comment on it a little bit more. Thank you, Lee. I don't know if you want to look back at the, at the amount that was prescribed, because if we have any health officials, I think they yeah, I think you said 120 milligrams. Sorry, um, 1,200 milligrams. Thank you. Just to, to make sure, just in case we have any experts uh, listening in and they think that that might not be correct. So, yeah, in, in answer to that, uh, as you would expect, the training, training of staff is an operational matter, which is the responsibility of the officers and the allocation of budgets is not part of the remit of this committee. However, the committee does recognise the importance of ensuring that housing staff are trained in all aspects of housing and associated law and policy. Officers have assured this committee that essential training for housing staff has not been has not declined or deferred for budget reasons. And if it's OK, a more detailed written response to this question will be provided by officers. So, um, as I say, in one sense, although the question didn't exactly you know, it ended up not being in the remit. I would not be surprised at all if there is then a conversation between the housing committee councillors and their council staff about, you know, asking more questions about, you know, what is the budget, how does that work and all the rest of it. So although there's not a direct positive outcome from the question, I think that it will lead to, you know, essentially, if nothing else, the, the existing budget being protected for staff. You know, because as a, you know, something that's kind of, I guess, it's, it's worth saying is that housing officers don't, there is no housing officer qualification as far as I know and they're kind of expected to come into this role where you're dealing with very vulnerable people in all sorts of situations and you're actually subject to not only the housing act but you're subject to the equality act the care act the dpa um probably some other stuff as well which i've forgotten about but basically you know you need housing officers will need to have a really good understanding of certain aspects of these other laws in order to do their job lawfully so the care act is a good example because it's a unitary authority if a housing officer has reason to be someone may have care and support needs then a section nine assessment should take place under the care act that's something which we've not really kind of got anywhere with seeing through yet but that's something that should happen and as i say well well-meaning housing officers probably wouldn't know that we wouldn't have been trained on that at all so i see this as being a kind of a, a positive outcome to that question we just go on to the next okay moving on then to um question number three which comes from katie wellborn Lee? The, the question is that the council's duties to assist people who are homeless arise in a wide range of situations where it would not be immediately obvious to someone unfamiliar with homelessness law that the person was homeless. For example, this could be where a person is a victim of domestic abuse or harassment, where they cannot afford a home, where their home is unsuitable for their health needs, or their home is in very poor repair or overcrowded. Some people may approach their ward counsellor at a surgery for advice about housing without realising that they may be legally homeless. Is there anything the committee can do to ensure that all councillors are aware of these wider statutory definitions of homelessness and how councillors can ensure anyone approaching them for adv advice receives prompt and potentially immediate assistance from the council, particularly in emergency cases? So just a little bit of background on this question. 
the, the code of guidance, homelessness code of guidance makes it clear that homelessness applications can be made to any department of the local authority. Now, I'm not a lawyer, as you should know by now, um, but it, 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 my, my reading of that would be that, you know, because councillors are part of the local authority, if someone is going to them in the advice surgeries or contacting them by email and basically asking for help with their housing and giving them reasons to believe they might be homeless or threatened with homelessness, then section 184 of the Housing Act will kick in at that point. Um, now, you know, as I say, it's not something I've seen kind of play out in any complaints yet. It may well end up being one because I think it's an important issue. But essentially, this question is designed at having some, you know, essentially kind of uh, upskilling the 40 councillors in the in the council and, and kind of doing some sort of training around, you know, educating them about when someone is actually home. So when the council, the, ha the housing department needs to be informed, because, you know, as, as the question says, it's not always obvious, you know, if you're a lay person, you think of homelessness as being an issue of rough sleeping. Councillors are lay people, um, you know, so it's not often that they have kind of particular expertise around homelessness. And therefore, they're going to have people in you know, very distressed states coming to them, asking about, you know, uh, help, help with housing when they kind of might be talking about domestic abuse or kind of, yeah, all those kind of things. And actually, I would say housing, you know, Section 184 would get triggered in those situations. And even if it's not, you know, and I think it is, it's still obviously you know expedient for councillors to be referring into the housing option service as soon as possible anyway because again it's a quick win you know housing law can turn people's lives around for the better very quickly if you're a councillor why wouldn't you want to know about it in order to to kind of improve your you know the life chances of the people you're representing so um that's kind of that's that's the reason for this question you know pretty straightforward really what it's aiming to do Thank you. Well, I'm sure that the whole committee agrees that it is important that all councillors are aware of the wider definition of homelessness and are able to ensure that anyone approaching them for advice at any time is advised how to contact the council's homelessness service, including the emergency contact arrangements and out of out, outside of normal office hours. And therefore, uh, an updated information about this process will be sent to all councillors. Nice quick win. You know, they, they've got, they're going to have information. They're going to be thinking about homelessness now, which, as I say, is part of the reason for this exercise anyway, is to kind of raise the attention that homelessness has. Um, so it's, that's a nice little outcome there. And question number four, the last question is from Shannon Johnston. Um, earlier this year, we made a Freedom of Information request asking for figures on waiting times on Bedford Borough Council's housing register for people who, due to their disabilities, needed accessible housing in comparison to applicants who did not need accessible housing. Although this is a complex issue, the data suggests that people with disabilities, particularly those who rely on a wheelchair, seem to have to wait much longer to get housed when compared to people without disabilities due to a lack of accessible housing. This could in part be the result of a national trend in developers neglecting the construction of accessible housing due to lower profitability, a problem that is highlighted in the Equality and Human Rights Commission's 2018 report, Housing and Disabled People, Britain's Hidden Crisis. There is a report on the agenda this evening regarding the allocation of social housing. And will the Housing Committee a request a more detailed analysis of waiting times for people with and without disabilities on the housing register, and in particular those who rely on a wheelchair in their home? And b assuming that the data does reveal a significant difference in waiting times, will the committee investigate why there is a discrepancy and what action the council may be able to take to increase the availability of accessible accommodation with the public sector equality duty in mind, and in particular whether there is a shortage of accessible accommodation locally due to developers neglecting the construction of accessible homes due to lower profitability. So again, this question is based on an FOI request we did earlier in the year, which um, you know it was it was kind of it wasn't it wasn't complete figures. But it's the, the, the FOR question itself was on the back of some, some families we've worked with where because one of the household members had a disability, they were having to wait a lot longer. And it's, it is a very complex issue because you've, you've got kind of black and white situations where someone needs a wheelchair, they therefore need wheelchair accessible accommodation. You've got kind of more complicated situations where you've got a household who's got a, you know, household members with disabilities and the, the outcome of those disabilities is they need a bit another bedroom 
And so essentially they need a bigger property than they would ordinarily need. And because there is a lack of particularly four bed and, and three beds for lesser extent um, kind of properties in the area, although it's not kind of directly discriminatory, um, they, because they have a disability, they are having to wait longer. So it's kind of what I would describe as indirect discrimination. It's not something I'm, you know, I'm not in any way familiar with the, the terminology, but because they, because they need a four bed rather than a three bed, for example, because of the, you know, maybe the children's disabilities, that's what's required they have to wait a long, long time. Um, you know, really, it's really grim, you know, so we can do our job as, a, as a, an advocate, get them the correct banding, you know, there may be band A, band, or certainly band B, and they're still having to wait for years to get a property. So that's kind of the, the kind of the basis for this question. I'll, I'll let the, the answer play. Thank you. Well, any discrepancies in waiting times for social housing being experienced by disabled persons if this is the case, is an important issue, and yes, it should be investigated. So I propose that the committee should request a further report on housing allocations from officers as part of its work programme to investigate any discrepancy and recommend any action that the council may be able to take to increase the availability of accessible accommodation. And just like the first question, I think we will take this under item 10, which is our work programme. So just one, maybe one other thing to say about this question, I, I, you would have to take my word for it, but I remember being in a housing committee maybe four or five years ago, and it was being discussed as an agenda item about effectively the proportion of, of houses being built weren't, you know, weren't affordable, there weren't enough affordable houses, there weren't enough accessible houses. And it seemed to me that the kind of the response from the committee was they kind of shrugged and said there was nothing we can do about it. And there may be very limited things they can do about this, I don't know. But for me, unless they've marched on Parliament, you know, they can't say they've done everything they can do. So I think that's really what it might. It might well actually take something like that, where they're actually having to, you know, think outside the box in order to challenge these developers to actually sit on them till they actually build the right number of houses. And it's actually, as I say, it's accessible. And it may that may well require, you know, it might require um, developers having to build larger properties, which are not, as I say, they're not as profitable because of the way everything works. Um, but that's something that, you know, it's an equality issue. It's something they have to do. An interesting kind of bit from the Equality Act guidance is that, you know, in times of austerity, it's even more important that the law is around equality is followed. So I think, you know, if, if we're going to have a depression or a recession now, it's something that, you know, is, is now more than ever, we should be making sure that disabled people have access to housing, have, a, have the same access to housing that everyone else does. Um, so that's kind of probably where I'm going to leave it. I'll see if there's anything else that's said at this point. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you very much, Mike. Mike, you can stay with us or you can leave. So um, you don't have to stay, by the way. Uh, so if you're ever going to a meeting that's in person or whether it's online or whatever, you can just ask your questions and leave because, you know, obviously the, the less time you're needed to be there for, the more able you're able to get there. And something that we're going to work on in Beth Borough is we're trying to get together a group of people from across different communities um, who will be up for regularly attending the meeting because we've been as I say it's a missed opportunity from my point of view if if I'd have thought this through a year ago when the committees first went online we could have probably used a lot more we could have got got a lot more information out there but as it returns to in person as, as lockdown finishes ultimately we're going to need a, a kind of a group of people to show that actually it is an important issue so that's something we're also going to work towards in the future um but yeah I, I hope this I hope the video is helpful as I say it's kind of you know I no way am I an expert on this stuff at all. We're just kind of learning a few bits, but hopefully I've kind of demonstrated that, that this is like an additional thing you can do in your local area to improve services for homeless people. Um, and, and I think actually, yeah, if you're clever about it and if you kind of stick with it, I think you can you can really change your council's practices around quite dramatically. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna make videos about the other, the other committees we've already been in. I'm starting with the most recent, but I'm gonna work backwards. Um, and I'll see if there's a way of kind of continuing to do it once things go back to in-person. So, um, but yeah, does say do share this around. Super hats do not end homelessness. This is the stuff that ends homelessness. So it is, you know, as boring as it might be, it is important to do it.